Formula 1 celebrates its great cars constantly, and rightly so, but here at the race we don't want any of the teams to think they've got away with us forgetting about some of the times they got it wrong. So we have picked out the worst car produced by each of the 10 teams currently in F1 to reveal what made them such abject failures. There were a few Ferraris that finished lower in the championship, but none was so far off the pace as the car Jean Alesi and Ivan Capelli were lumbered with in 1992. The Ferrari F92A suffered from a multitude of problems, which reflected the situation Ferrari was in at a time before Jean Top began his revolution in the middle of the following season. The chassis initially suffered from poor weight distribution and grip was inconsistent. Jean-Claude Migeaux's innovative twin-floor design promised much, but the drivers lacked confidence. This was partly improved by the introduction of the F92 AT variant of the car, with modified suspension and a reinterpretation of the twin-floor towards the end of the season, but the real problem was the engine. Thirsty, unreliable and down on power, the only thing the 3.5-litre V12 did well was produce a pleasingly shrill wail. So bad were the problems that Ferrari even reverted to its 1991 spec engine for the Mexican Grand Prix. Oil system problems caused failures early in the season, while blow-by cost compression and therefore power as the fuel-air mix was pushed past the piston rings into the crankcase, forcing the scavenge systems to work harder. A remarkable 220 V12s were available to Ferrari for use on and off track that year, but it was always well behind the best of the engines of 1992, at times by as much as 100 brake horsepower. The first Toro Rosso is probably the most controversial F1 car you've forgotten about. Red Bull took over the ailing Minardi team in November the previous year, reshaping it as a junior squad, but when Toro Rosso, which was renamed Alpha Tauri in 2020, hit the track in testing with what was very obviously the 2005 Red Bull, many rivals objected. A new car was promised, but as team principal Franz Tost later confirmed, the STR01 was little more than a development of the RB1. But that wasn't the end of the controversy. Toro Rosso also inherited what some considered an illegal engine deal, thanks to former Minardi owner Paul Stoddart negotiating permission to continue with the lower-cost Cosworth V10 engines running with a rev restriction of 16,700 RPM despite rules mandating a V8 on the basis this was the only way it could survive. There were also fears of shock results thanks to the extra torque of the engine. These fears proved ridiculous as the engine couldn't be developed and Toro Rosso struggled. The STR01's average grid position was 16th, and Vitantonio Liuzzi scored its only point of the season at Indianapolis. But the car did at least earn a footnote in F1 history as the last to race with V10 power. When Renault announced it was joining the World Championship with a 1.5-litre turbocharged engine, the rest of the field, all running 3-litre normally aspirated engines, was seriously worried. After all, everybody knew the potential turbos had. But when the car hit the track it was ungainly, earning the nickname the Yellow Teapot, desperately unreliable and just not very quick. It didn't score a point until its 17th start in the hands of Jean-Pierre Jouy, although it did have a moment of glory when the Frenchman put it on pole position for the 1979 South African Grand Prix, shortly before the car was replaced. The problem was that, while turbocharged engines had huge potential, Renault lacked the technology and, crucially, the right fuel to master it at first. It took a lot of time and money to refine the components brought in from outside suppliers, but the work done in harness with fuel supplier ELF was what made the big difference. Controlling the temperature of the fuel was impossible initially, and it took a long time to develop and refine the required anti-detonation agents to keep the engine under control. The car itself was designed to be simple but effective, but prior to the switch to a twin-turbo version of the engine, the turbo lag made it incredibly difficult to drive. In all its forms, the car was only a classified finisher six times, but the work being done during this period means this unsuccessful Renault laid the foundations for the turbo era to come.
We tried very hard to come up with a worse Williams than last year's, but by every single metric, it is the least competitive of all the machines made by the team since it was formed in 1977. Nothing was right about the FW42, which wasn't even ready for the start of testing. When it finally did run, it was slow and gradually shook itself to pieces. To make matters worse, the clever wing mirror and suspension designs the team had come up with proved illegal and had to be changed. Unsurprisingly, all of this led to the departure of Chief Technical Officer Paddy Lowe, even before the season started. The Williams was light on downforce, draggy, overweight, and was, over the season, 2% off the back of the midfield pace, a bigger gap than the one separating the front of the grid and the head of the midfield. George Russell delivered most of the best, or perhaps that should be least worst, moments, but teammate Robert Kubica nicked the team's sole point at Hockenheim. Williams battled on, and the race team did what it could, but in the second half of the season, upgrades failed to get Williams onto the back of the midfield pack, as hoped. In a word, irredeemable. Sometimes, things go so disastrously wrong that you have no choice but to throw away what you've got and start again. That's exactly what happened to McLaren in 1979, when it designed and built a mid-season replacement for the struggling M28 in double-quick time. The car was troubled right from the start. It was the first ground-effect car raced by McLaren, following the lead set by Lotus, but the fact it suffered a crash in the wind tunnel before its first proper test was perhaps a warning of what was to come. When it did have its first full test at Watkins Glen, it was discovered that the Nomex Honeycomb chassis, designed to be thin to maximise the potential for creating ground effect down the side of the car, wasn't strong enough and was distorting. But despite a strong run to third on debut in Argentina, and optimism that it compared well to the Lotus 79, the pace of ground effect development was so fast that the car quickly slid into uncompetitiveness. It was too draggy, too heavy, and didn't create as powerful ground effect as the leading cars and it also struggled to work the direction the Goodyear tyres evolved in as the season progressed. All of this led to it being abandoned in favour of the improved, but still mediocre, McLaren M29. The last thing you need ahead of the biggest regulation change in F1 history is to start late. But thanks to not signing its Ferrari engine deal until September, ahead of the introduction of the V6 turbo hybrid rules, Sauber was well behind the curve right from the off. That the Ferrari was the weakest of the engines in 2014 made matters worse for a package that was overweight by 15 kilos at the start of the season. Sauber didn't claw back as much of the downforce lost to the new rules as rivals did, thanks to its late start, with the packaging challenges of the Ferrari power unit creating what was described as a big box at the rear of the car. Crucially, the car didn't maximise the underfloor airflow, reducing the potential of the diffuser, with the size of the blockage created by the engine package a problem that couldn't be got around. Reliability problems, difficulty refining the new brake-by-wire technology, and struggles making the Pirelli rubber last prior to a suspension upgrade in Monaco, combined with a car that was aerodynamically troubled to add up to a pointless season. For the only time in the team's history, it finished last in the Constructors' Championship. Red Bull was once unrecognisable as the F1 super team it would become. In 2006, the year of Adrian Newey's arrival, it was still in a building phase after taking over the struggling Jaguar team ahead of the 2005 season. The RB2 was the first true Red Bull given its predecessor was a rebadged version of what would have been the Jaguar R6, but it also proved to be the least competitive of all its cars. A switch to Ferrari engines didn't deliver the hopeful step forward, with overly aggressive cooling packaging costing Red Bull a huge amount of track time pre-season and compromising the bodywork. Newey eventually insisted on a switch to Renault for 2007 when told there would likely only be one engine upgrade during the year from Ferrari. The car proved decent enough on low speed corners, but less good in the higher speed, so it was no surprise Monaco produced its best result, with David Coulthard taking a surprise third place. Results were very patchy, but behind the scenes work was going on to turn this struggling midfielder into an operation that would dominate F1 in the first half of the next decade. 
running what is essentially an evolution of one of the worst cars of two years earlier is hardly a promising start for a new Formula 1 team, but that's exactly what Force India had to do in its first season. At the start of its journey to becoming a midfield powerhouse, the team that later became Racing Point ran the VJM01, which was heavily based on the snappily named Spyker F8 V11B, derived from the Midland M16, raced in 2006. The VJM01 was a rebodied version of the Spyker, with new side pods, barge boards, and floor diffuser package. There were updates during the season with a seamless shift gearbox bringing a few tenths of a second and a significant aerodynamic upgrade for Silverstone that also introduced inerters to the front and rear suspension. The problem for Force India was simply that it was, at heart, an old design that was fundamentally limited in performance. It carried too much drag for its downforce level, which meant it was never a threat for points in normal conditions, even though its pace deficit to the front was respectable, indicative of the good job the team did in difficult circumstances. Giancarlo Fisichella took its best result, only 10th, but Adrian Suttil was running a sensational 4th with 8 laps to go in the Monaco Grand Prix when Kimi Raikkonen lost it on the brakes in the damp approaching the chicane and rear-ended the Force India. Gene Haas's F1 team is too young to give us many cars to choose from, but we can't cheat by calling on the unrelated Carl Haas's mid-1980s F1 machines. But of the four Dallara-designed Haas chassis, the 2019 version was comfortably the worst. It was an infuriating car, because when things were right it was capable of being the fastest in the midfield. The trouble is, things were rarely right. It needed relatively low temperatures and the right track configuration to work. A fundamental problem related to the change in front wing regulations led to the rear end aerodynamics often stalling, a problem exaggerated by subsequent car developments that didn't tackle the problem. While the problem didn't manifest itself in the fast corners, it made the car difficult in the braking zones and in low and medium speed corners, so it became tricky to drive and very hard on the rear tyres thanks to the back end sliding around. More often than not, drivers Roman Grosjean and Kevin Magnussen plummeted down the order in races, complaining about it being like driving in the wet. Mercedes has been so successful in Formula 1 that it's impossible to find a genuinely bad car to choose as its worst. It says a lot that we have no choice but to select the Mercedes W02, which was still the fourth best car of the 2011 season and regularly finished in the top six, despite never making the podium. The 2011 car was limited by the initial concept. Mercedes opted for a short wheelbase, which proved to be at odds with the arrival of the blown diffuser that had the best effect when the floor length at the rear of the car was maximised. It also meant a higher centre of gravity when on a full fuel load, making the car harder on tyres early in races in particular. Tyres were a particular problem for Mercedes in the first year of Pirelli's deal. There were brief occasions when the car showed a genuinely good turn of pace, notably when Nico Rosberg qualified third for the Turkish Grand Prix. But it was difficult to get the tyres to work well enough to deliver such performances over a lap, and near impossible to do so over a race stint. Not a great car, certainly, but still a key part of the learning curve that made Mercedes the dominant force in F1. Well, those are our 10 choices, but what do you think of our collection of no-hopers, disappointment and failures by the 10 current F1 teams? Let us know which cars we've left out in the comments below, and don't forget to like this video and hit subscribe.